All right, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word and open your Bible to Exodus. We'll look at chapter 12, verse 12 as text for the message this morning. Although we are working through the plagues, which and we're looking at the first four plagues particularly, which is covered in chapters 7, beginning of verse 14 through chapter 8. <coughs> However, Exodus 12, verse 12 provides an insight that undergirds the main point of the message this morning. Exodus 12 and verse number 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all, excuse me, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And it's that, that phrase down there, against all the gods of Egypt, that I want to pick up on this morning. Father, help me to preach in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit of God, for only by your Spirit <clears throat> can I have any hope that the word spoken here this morning will have the impact and effect upon the hearts of these who are here that's needed and that you desire to, to accomplish, Lord, in us. <clears throat> that's a very important message, Lord, <clears throat> in so many ways and on so many levels. <clears throat> And I feel the importance of it weighing on me as I preach it. I pray, Lord God, that the transfer of that burden will be complete, that it will go from your heart to ours, and we will receive it and humble ourselves under the message you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <coughs> I have a little trouble with my chest this morning, but hopefully this water will help me. All right, we're looking at, are you ready for this? God's judgment upon America's gods. Thank you. God's judgment upon America's gods. <clears throat> we're always on the look for some way to address this when it happens. And these have been, uh, this is a fisherman's cough drop. These have been the most effective. <clears throat> the only problem is, as I learned last time, if I put this in my mouth right now, it blows up like an Alka-Seltzer. I'm all over it trying to, I, I can't talk around it, so I can't, you, where's Mrs. Scheidbox? You probably sent these up here. Yeah, so I can't use these for preaching time. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and endure a couple, <clears throat> is that all right? I, I'm, I'm going to have to, yeah, I get the calm, that's better for this. If I get these earlier, it's better. Sorry to deal with this personal stuff, but you know what? The, I, my life is so weird. If I don't deal with this right now, the next time I'll think about it is the next time they're handed to me when I'm in the pulpit. So it's just, phew, things are moving fast. Amen. <clears throat> but anyway, the Chronicles of Moses, God's judgment upon America's gods. We've noticed that God begin, begins and ends his redemption program with blood. And it's interesting that in the plagues, they are bookended with blood. The first plague was blood. And the last one, when God takes the firstborn, is marked by the blood being stricken upon the doorposts. And the significant and the focus of the last plague really is the blood of the Lamb, which is representative, of course, of the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. So the plagues begin and end <clears throat> with blood, which is very interesting. <clears throat> the first three plagues, remember, afflicted both the Egyptians and the Hebrews. <clears throat> the Hebrews resisted God's message. Remember that? Now this is a very important part of the message, a point in the message. So hopefully I've alerted your ears to listen to something. It'll come back up. Uh, it'll come up again later in the message. <clears throat> because the question, the obvious question is, why would God include the Hebrews in the first three plagues and then exclude them from the fourth plague forward? The whole idea of the plagues was to bring the nations of the world under the rod of God. That was the point of all of this. It was to establish the sovereign rule of God in the earth. <clears throat> More than once, God said that this demonstration of his power was intended by him to be heard throughout the world and was intended by him to be a notification that he asserted 
the position as sole sovereign of all the nations, of all the world. <clears throat> You'll notice how many times this exodus is brought up again throughout the life of Israel. Over and over and over again, all the way into the days of David and beyond, the Spirit of God would take their memory back to the exodus and remind them of His great deliverance. It was intended by God that the whole world would be brought under the authority of the rod of God through this great demonstration of His power in the Exodus. <clears throat> well, that would include His own people. His own people needed also to be brought into submission to the rod of God. And they were rebelling. They rebelled against Moses. Remember, after Moses delivered the message to Pharaoh and Pharaoh increased their burdens, we understand it on a human level, but we're trying to help you wake up to the spiritual side of all human afflictions. The spiritual dimension that's behind all the physical stuff we go through. So we understand looking at it physically or horizontally, as we like to say, look at the horizontal view. We can understand why God's people <clears throat> would be unhappy with Moses <clears throat> because Moses came and he stirred things up and got him in hotter water. But they failed to understand the spiritual side of the whole thing. And so they rebelled against Moses' message. They rebelled against the authority of Moses, whom God appointed to lead them out of Egypt. Or, that is, they rebelled against the divinely ordained and stipulated authority for the congregation of Israel at that time. <coughs> As a consequence, it was necessary for God to bring Israel under the authority of the rod of God, along with the rest of the nations and all of Egypt. And so they were under that rod too. You get what I'm trying to say? So the first plague comes and maybe some of Israel said, why is my glass of water turned to blood? See, right? And maybe when the frogs started hopping around and maybe the Israelites said, why are the frogs in my house too? And maybe when the lice came, they said, why are the lice bugging us, biting us too? Right, you get my point? And they would say, wow. We are under the rod that God put into the hand of Moses. We are under that rod too. Now, I don't know if it's the case. It does seem to be the case that in these first three plagues, you notice how the people were quiet? <clears throat> Do you notice that you don't have any uprisings against Moses? Right? During the first three plagues, nobody spoke a word against Moses. Nobody got up and said, Hey, Moses, you're, uh, you're not a very good guy. What are you doing here? Why, why are we having the frogs? Why'd you bring frogs on us? Right? Why'd you bring blood on us? Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. That's good. When it burns my hands, that means it's just right. <clears throat> why, why, why? They didn't... Okay, you, you get my point? After Moses went in there and did all of his things and said, let the people go and... Moses and the Pharaoh got all haughty toddy and said, we're going to make you work even harder. And then they rose up and said, Moses, you're messing us up, didn't they? Did you notice, though, that when all the water and the land turned to blood, they didn't say a word? <clears throat> when the frogs came hopping into their house, they didn't say a word. When the lice got on them like it did everybody else, they didn't say a word. I think God said, okay, you get it. You need to understand that you are also under the rod that I put in Moses' hands. Just like Egypt is, so are you. Now that you've submitted to it and you've kept your mouth shut <laughs> and you haven't murmured and complained. Now later on, they murmur and complain, don't they? And what happens every time they do? They get whacked with the rod of God, don't they? Every single time. So I think that's the message of these first three plagues being a burden upon both God's own and upon the world because we're all under the rod of God not just those guys amen okay maybe I better preach that message and just stay with that one apparently that's the one <laughs> okay before God would put the sword of the Lord into the hands of his people he had first to make sure they submitted themselves to the rod of God. Amen? God doesn't put his sword 
into the hands of a people who are not submitted to him. Isn't there a verse in the Bible that goes something like this? Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God, period. After that, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Submission precedes authority. We must submit ourselves to authority before we can wield authority. Can I get an amen? And that's a very basic biblical principle. The fourth plague, however, God separated his people from the Egyptians and from there forward, he made a demonstration to everybody that I'm with these guys, not those guys. Now, why does God do that? Well, if his people received his law and would receive his authority and submit themselves to authority, God identifies with them and says to the guys that won't, he says, hey, you guys, I'm with them. I'm not with you. If you want me to be with you, get over here with them. So it's really very practical, isn't it? It's very, very basic. <clears throat> and we need to understand that basic principle. All right. We remember that God, whoop, <laughs> backed up. See, when I will this way, that's bad. Because now we're losing time. I'm just kidding around. Remember, God always addresses the spiritual when he's working in the physical. These are some fundamental things we've learned in the last couple of messages that are very important to remember as we go into the message today. <clears throat> when God <clears throat> acts in the physical, he has already done things in the spiritual. And he works in the spiritual realm when he moves into the physical realm. And so when we come to the swarm of flies, remember, we showed that God did not tell Moses to use his rod to strike any dirt or to strike any water or to swing it in the air to bring flies. He basically said, okay, Moses, step aside. I've got this one. I mean, I'm paraphrasing in order to kind of clarify what I think is going on here. <clears throat> God comes in and he does this one himself. Now, he did the others himself too. Amen? I mean, Moses didn't make anything happen with that stick. Whatever he did with the stick, that was just a way of, this is very important. The reason God has the rod in Moses' hand and Moses hits the water and this stuff happens is because God is saying, okay, everybody, get, it, get this. I'm with this guy. Listen to what he's saying because he speaks for me. That's what God's doing. He's establishing Moses' authority in the land. <clears throat> That's what he's doing with that. <clears throat> okay. So, now we come, however, to this fourth one where we're dealing with Baalzebub. Remember, I went through all that with you? I explained how the fly, and we went, I, I can't preach that sermon right now. So if you didn't get it, all I can tell you right now is Beelzebub is the word that's used in the New Testament. Is Baalzebub, which is the word used in the Old Testament, same word. It's, you know, one's kind of a Hebrew way of saying it, and the other's the, uh, more of a Greek way of saying it. But the bottom line is, same God, and it's Satan. This morning in our Bible study, we showed how Satan is worshipped today in the image of a goat. <clears throat> and that's because <sighs> I'm paralyzed. Somebody pick that back up. I can't preach. I'm telling you, I'll, I'll think about that the whole time. I'm trying to think about what I need to say to you. It'll drive me out of my mind. See, Satan knows he's going to sit right there and hold that. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, what was I saying before I was so rudely interrupted by the devil to knock that thing off here? Oh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I had invoked that idiot, and he jumps in here. Okay, well, get out of here. But anyway, so Baphomet is the image of a goat, and he's worshipped under that image today in the occult and everything. But God's name for him is Baalzebub. Isn't that funny? He calls himself Baphomet, and he's represented as the goat because that identifies with his high time in history when Alexander, the devil man, conquered the whole world and put the kingdoms into his power. He lost them when Jesus came, and you've heard me preach that more than once. But uh, So all that's going on, but anyway, my point here is that, guess what? God calls him Baalzebub. God says he's nothing more than the Lord of Flies. So it's a term of derision against the enemy of our soul. Nothing but a fly. 
He's a Lord of flies. Interesting. <clears throat> and so God steps in and he demonstrates his power over the Lord of flies. Over Satan himself. And it reminded you how he did a similar thing with Job. He shows up with Job and, and tells him in all of his misery, stand to your feet. And, and he gives him some exhortation and he begins with this. You can't handle Leviathan. You need to leave him to me. And so when God stepped in to do a judgment that would be aimed very directly at Beelzebub, he did it himself. I think it's very pregnant with meaning and, and, and insight for us that God did it that way. And so the fourth plague is a pivotal plague. It's where God has turned his attention now to the chief spiritual power behind all of the oppression that was coming down on the people of God through Pharaoh. And it's a time when he separates his people from the Egyptians and begins now focusing his, his judgments upon Egypt specifically. We have learned God judged Egypt because their leaders refused to yield to the following fundamental truths. And this is like the chorus of a song in the sense that this is like the refrain. It comes up over and over and over throughout the revelation of God's word. God is sovereign over all. God hates oppression and he extends liberty to his people. In other words, Egypt violated the fundamentals. Egypt violated the, the, the truth that God is sovereign, not the Pharaoh and no one else, no other God. God is sovereign. And next, God demands his people be given liberty. God hates oppression. So we've learned that. However, the people of God had to cry out to him for relief before he would act. And that's true throughout the scripture. These basic principles that underlie the whole story here that we're looking at are true throughout the Bible. It's by grace are you saved through faith. It's for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord that shall be saved. We have to call on him. First Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. And will forgive their sins and will heal their land. There's the if and the then. And it wasn't until they did the if that they got the then. It's when they called on him with all their heart. You mean to say nobody ever said, God, help us from time to time throughout their ordeal under Pharaoh? Of course they did. But you find him when you seek for him with what? Your whole heart. Sometimes when we're praying and crying out to God, he's waiting for the rest of your heart to show up. Half-hearted prayers won't cut it. So when the people cried out with a full heart of grief against the oppression they were suffering, then God entered in. There are important reasons that God does that in that way that we don't get the chance to go into in this message, but I want you to understand. There's a reason God wants your whole heart there. Before he steps in. Finally we understand that when God moves to deliver. He moves through the spiritual into the physical. As I pointed out. He addresses spiritual powers and principalities. That stand behind and support the physical potentates. Isn't that a great word? Monarchs. Rulers that assume their authority comes from themselves. Tyrants in other words. Or autocrats. These spiritual powers and principalities claim territory in the physical world by seducing men to give their worship to something or someone other than God. That's the strategy Satan has used successfully from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, right on through the Bible, his strategy is always the same. He wants to seduce us to give worship to something other than God. In the case of Adam and Eve, he seduced them with, or her at least, and then she, him, with the idea that they could be God. Ye shall be as God. So the worship of self. So based on these things we consider, what are the gods of America? What are the gods of America that give the devil's place in our land? 
Now, hopefully I've set this up correctly. Egypt was oppressing God's people. When God moved to deliver them, he judged their gods and the land. So he judged the spiritual powers that stood behind and propped up the tyranny of Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. <clears throat> That's what's happened in America. How do these devils gain this power in a land? Through the worship of idols. Because the Egyptians worshipped false gods, they were actually, knowingly or unknowingly, worshipping devils. That's what the Bible teaches in Leviticus and in 1 Corinthians, that when we worship idols or images, we are actually worshipping the devil behind it. The idols in the world, idols in our lives, idols in our homes, idols in our churches, idols, things we worship that when we take our worship from God and give it to something else, that, that always ends up in the hands of some devil. Because God refuses it. And so some devil gets it. And when the devil gets it, he gets to claim territory by right of that. Do you understand that principle? All right, now watch. America's, America's gods and the oppressors that serve them and rule by their power. In America right now, not, if, happily not all rulers, but many of our rulers are literally under the power of Satan. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So these people who have positions of power in our government, who are not Christians, they are taken captive by Satan at his will. They can use, Satan can use them whenever he wants to and whenever he needs to, to get something going forward that he wants unless they're resisted by other things around them. In our case, we have the Constitution that gives us a kind of umbrella of protection. But you see what they're doing with it. They're twisting it and reinterpreting it and doing all kinds of things to take away our liberties. Well, how do they gain the power to do that? It's when Christians, basically, end up in it unwisely and foolishly diverting their worship to other things. I'll get into that in just a moment, but it's all about idolatry the growth of superstitious idolaters in America they're superstitious idolatry you know today there are only 22 percent of Americans who identify with mainline Protestant denominations and of course this always gives rise to uh, gives me the, the feeling I need to explain we're Baptists not Protestants now obviously we protest the Catholic Church and its false doctrines so in that regard, you might say we're Protestant, but we're not Protestant historically. We were protesting the errors of, of the Catholic system way long before Luther ever showed up with his 95 theses. Long before. There's all kinds of proof of that I don't have time to go into right now. So just so you understand. But however, most people look at the world as divided between Protestants and Catholics, the Christian world, Protestants and Catholics. To only 29% today, or 22%, I'm sorry, of Americans identify with mainline Protestant denominations, while 29% believe in astrology. Um, Alexandria Ocasio, whoever she is, being among them. Cortez, right? She's one of them. Yeah, she has recently given her birth chart to some guru that's supposed to interpret her thing and all this kind of stuff. The Coven of Brooklyn hexed Kavanaugh to the delight of a bunch of witches called the Magic Resistance. The Magic Resistance is a group of witches that have identified themselves as anti-Trump. Magic resistance witches cast a binding spell against Trump soon after his inauguration. Isn't that weird? 
I'll be talking to you about binding and loosing the power we have spiritually to bind and loose. Devil knows about that. And he tries to use it himself. Interesting. Articles like, this is how real life resistance witches say they're taking down the patriarchy is, a, is uncomfortably popular. Gets a lot of hits and a lot of reads. There's another one titled How the Socialist Feminists of Witch Use Magic to Fight Capitalism. I know, it is kind of funny. Superstitious idolatry. And we know it's vanity, but this is going on on that side. What's going on on our side? Isn't it funny that they're busy actively spirit exercising themselves spiritually to influence America? We're failing if we think that we're going to overcome in America if we don't engage spiritually. The connection between the Hail Satan crowd, and there is a group called the Hail Satan group, whatever, and leftist politics today lines up in stark contrast to the almost complete identification of biblical Christianity with the right. In other words, I'm not the only guy that's noticing this. People on the other side, the dark side of spiritual things, they're saying the same thing. They're saying the America is dividing up between People who believe in, in witches and Satanism and all that stuff and the people who believe in biblical Christianity. America is being divided. And the left has been inundated with the influence of the witch crowd. And on the right, politically, is where most Bible-believing Christians have moved in reaction. Interesting, isn't it? So we're dividing up. That's what I've been trying to tell you. This war coming into 2020, it's about the Antichrist spirit versus the spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what it is about. It's not about Republicans and Democrats anymore. It's about the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. That's the way America is dividing and aligning. Contemporary witch culture openly identifies as, get this, quote, the cosmic counterbalance to Trumpian evangelicalism. Isn't that funny? As far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as Trumpian evangelicalism. There's just biblical Christianity versus the rest. But how funny that they've, they've, what, they, what they're saying is, and there's some truth in it, that basically it's the evangelical groundswell of support that rose up and pushed Trump over the edge, over the, uh, the barrier, and got him in. Now their understanding is, and that's the reason that Trump is, is treating them so good, because he knows that's his base. I don't believe that. I trust that's not the case. I trust it's because Trump actually believes these things he's saying. In any event, there's nothing, there's nothing called Trumpian evangelicalism. But there is biblical evangelicalism, or biblical Christianity is what I prefer to say. And biblical Christianity believes certain things and holds certain values and cherishes certain ideals. And it just so happens that this president is championing those beliefs, those values, and those ideals. And so therefore we're lining up with him. But that's the reason. Not because we view Trump as some kind of savior. Good heavens. But the other side is trying to say that kind of thing, trying to suggest that. That's because that's the way they think. They're, they're devil worshipers, and they worship idols, and they, they're worship... It's, it's like a prostitute. It's for sale, whoever wants to buy it. That's the way their worship is. They give their worship to whatever. Whatever will pay the price for it. But we have dedicated our worship to God and to God alone. 
but because they think like prostitutes spiritually, then they assume that the only reason we're following after Trump is because we're worshiping him? I mean, it's bizarre. You probably haven't been touched with that bizarre kind of thinking because you haven't gone into it, studied it as I have. And I, I, I don't blame you, and I don't even think you should bother. I just wanted to make you aware of something. The other side is spiritually engaged. That's the point. We had better get spiritually engaged. Politically, this crowd justifies their reaction to American evangelicalism on the ground that it's white, patriarchal, Christian, and that it is the de facto state religion. This brings up another very important observation. America has always been understood by its founders and by all that succeeded them up until about 19, in the 1960s is when this transition began. Now, the seeds that led to that 1960s transition were planted back in the 20s. And I don't have time to give you a whole history lesson here. And you can even get back into the 1800s with Darwin and all that kind of stuff and German rationalism. I mean, I can get really detailed in this, but I don't want to take the time. I don't think I need to. The point is, you get into the 60s and there was a, a clear coming out of the closet of unbelief. So up till then, everybody understood that America was a Christian nation. Now, that's a problem. You see, back in the days of our founding, being a Christian nation was accepted and, and considered, yeah, that's what we are. Sure, of course. One nation under God. No, duh. Right? But now, that's a problem. Now there are people out there saying, that's not right. That's not good. That's, we should have separation of church and state. And, so there should, and they've taken that, that doctrine that was supposed to protect faith from being dictated by the government. They've taken that doctrine and turned it on its head. And now they're using the power of government to interfere with us believing what we want to believe. It's just amazing what's happened. But that's what's happened. Anyway, the growth of a Christianity that embraces occult craft is very alarming. Be amazed how many Christians talk about karma. Right? How'd that happen? Karma is a pagan idea. I preached a series on paganism a while back. You can get that online, and it explains all this in great detail. I don't have time to go into it right now. But karma is a pagan idea. We don't do karma, we do divine providence. Divine providence is what we believe in, not karma. Used to, people talked about providence. Regularly, you go back and read the old guys. Yeah, older than me even. And you'll hear them and read about them talking about providence. Providence is, providence that, 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 referring to providence. Now we talk about karma? What's going on here? There's something referred to by some as a remix that's going on where it's like they're taking all these various religious traditions and mixing them all together. Today you can have people who identify themselves as Christian who will attend yoga classes. You didn't know that yoga was a religion? You thought it was just exercises. They'll attend yoga classes. They'll practice Buddhist meditation. Yeah. They'll read tarot cards and go tee hee hee. Some will even go so far as to cleanse their house with sage. You can go into a Christian's home today. I mean, not the kind of Christian you probably interact with coming from a church like ours. Although some of this stuff even gets into our circles. But there probably aren't too many people here that will put sage in their house as a cleansing, spiritual cleansing agent. But there are Christians who do that. And it means nothing. They just, yeah, that's, our, that's, that's my cleansing state. That's my cleansing sage. We cleanse our homes by the blood of a lamb, Amen. 
and by our testimony and loving not our lives to the death. That's how we overcome the devil. But there are Christians who, who do this sort of things. And the same people will go and attend uh, Christmas carol concerts. They'll go to Shabbat dinners. And, and then they'll attend Christian church services. And it's all blended and mixed together. And they're very satisfied to have all these different spiritual traditions all mixed together. Many Christians today regularly refer. I mentioned the karma thing. I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Many Christians today read their horoscope faithfully. Some Christians read their horoscope more faithfully than they read the Bible. How does anybody call themselves a Christian and they read their horoscope more faithfully than they read the Bible? A lot of Christians for a long time were talking about what's your sign, man? Oh, I'm Pisces and I'm... No, you're a Christian. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. Your personality isn't defined by astrological charts. Your personality is defined mostly by your character. And then by the influence of the Spirit of God in you, bearing the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, do I need to go on? What happened to that paradigm for discerning spiritual character? Not controlled by the fates, and by some and dictated by some astrological sign. What a bunch of nonsense. Superstitious idolatry. That's what it is. They refer to their horoscope and astrological sign as if these things were valid sources of spiritual insight. Others will say, will refer to these things and just kind of tee it off and laugh it off, not understanding that God considers these things abominable. They might tap into the perceived psychic energy of their surroundings. Christian people talk like this. Well, they call themselves Christians. Whether or not they are, I'd have to talk, speak with them more thoroughly. But uh, people who call themselves Christians talk like this. They're going to send energy. I'm sending positive energy to you. They think that's more valid than saying I'm praying for you. They think that means more than saying, I'm praying for you. I'm sending my energy to you. Then there's the ongoing superstitious idolatry of a sect of Christianity called Catholicism. But that's old news. That's been around for a long time. But you'll notice that Catholicism always gets a bump during times when darkness begins to prevail in any society. Isn't that interesting? As darkness increases in any culture, Catholicism rides high. It always gets a bump. That's because of the close association between Catholicism. It's kind of a Christian form of paganism. You got worship of Mary hidden under the language of hyperdulia. One of my wife's very favorite words. Hyperdulia. Extreme veneration, this kind of thing. Bowing before images of saints. You know, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 4 says, We are not to serve them, nor bow down to them. And in case you think I'm parsing something too finely, let me remind you that in Revelation 19.10, when John bowed down to worship the angel that revealed the revelation to him, the angel said, See thou do it not, worship God. Well, later on, in Revelation chapter number 22, John bows down to worship before the angel, not to worship the angel. In the first instance, he bowed down to worship the angel. The angel said, don't do this. Now, John wasn't a stubborn kind of person. He got the message. So the next time he was so moved and overwhelmed, he bowed down to worship before the feet of the angel, not to worship the angel. But before, and the angel said the same thing. See thou do it not. In other words, this pretentious nonsense about, well, I'm bowing down in front of the statue, but I'm not worshiping the statue. God said, don't bow down to them. Many of the essential worship practices of pre-Exodus Egypt, Egypt are showing up in American culture today. Many of them. 
the fascination and fixation on sexual relations in spiritual worship was a huge part of Egyptian worship. And I don't, I'm not comfortable to go into that in any further detail than to say to you that's exactly what's developing in American culture. Our children are being brought up on the stories of pagan gods and goddesses. They're not being brought up on the great biblical stories of the flood, the exodus, creation, David and Goliath, the stories of our Savior Jesus Christ. Your kids are, I understand that, but generally speaking, most Christian families are exposing their children to more indoctrination in the gods of the Greeks than they are in the God of the Bible. I dare say most children in America today know more about four than they do Jesus Christ. The superstitious idolatry of the left, however, is really not the reason for our troubles. It's the sophisticated idolaters that are giving us the problem. We could talk about the Catholics who rationalize bowing to statues, but what about the Christians who rationalize acceptance into their personal culture of all manner of pagan symbolism and ideology? I touched on it a little bit already. Christians who rationalize embracing elements of the occult like karma, forced theology, enamored by the tales of Thor and all this sort of thing. <clears throat> and then there are the sophisticated idolaters who worship other gods while pretending to worship the true and living God. Those who worship themselves. People don't understand worship. I've explained it several times to our congregation. Let me just remind you, basically when you get right down to the end of it, worship is when your will is let go of into God's hands. That's when worship is occurring. Worship is not occurring when you're going, I like you, Daddy, I like you, Daddy, ooh, ooh, I like you, Daddy. That's not when worship is occurring. Unless, underneath that, there is a submission of the will. Now, if there's a submission of the will underneath that, I like you, Daddy, then we're good. But most of, most of Christianity today <clears throat> isn't about will worship. It's about feeling good. Self-worshippers. There are a lot of Christians who are self-worshippers. Let me ask you this question. At the end of the day, who has ultimately the ultimate influence in your decisions? If you are the one who has the ultimate say-so in your decisions then you are your own God. If God has finally the final word in your decisions, if your decisions are referenced within the context of God's will for your life, then you worship God. But if the decisions you make day after day and so on as you go through life are basically referenced to you and you only without a reference to God, then you don't understand what spirit you are of. You've gotten confused somewhere along the way and you've lost your way and you've wandered off and out from under worshiping God. How about covetousness? The Bible says in Colossians 3, 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness which is idolatry. Let me explain covetousness to you. To covet is to set your desire upon a thing or a person so fully that the desire for that becomes the primary controlling influence over how you act and what you do. That's what covetousness does. Covetousness makes desire God. Covetousness puts your desires ahead of God. And when your desires <clears throat> are so stirred up and focused on something 
that you begin pursuing it without reference and regard for God, His will, or His laws, or His ways. That's why God calls that idolatry. That means that thing controls you and He doesn't. That is probably the root of sophisticated idolatry, as a matter of fact, in America. It's covetousness. And it comes down to the subtle seduction of the serpent. You can be as God. Essentially, America worships three idols. Self. self Self-esteem, all this junk, good night. One of the most prolific exports of American culture is self-love. We promote that and push that like no other culture in the world. Self-love is a huge American idol. <clears throat> it, sometimes it manifests itself in a love for freedom. Now that might shock you, but let me explain. <clears throat> I'm talking about a perverse freedom, the kind of freedom people demand that sets them free of the cords and bands of God's law. That kind of freedom. Licentiousness. Consider freedom from God's law invariably leads to tyranny under man. Whereas freedom under God always leads to liberty for all. Mammon. God number two in America. Mammon. That's the God of money. The love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible says. And the love and service to mammon is powerfully corrosive, powerfully corrupting. One reason God is so intent that we set our love and affection on things above and not things below is because God knows, of course, of the corrupting, the corrosive power of setting your affections on things below. How corrosive it is, how corrupting it is, how distorting it is of your morals. You have probably noticed that among the super rich are mostly a bunch of really perverse, wicked, and evil people. Not all, by the way. You don't hear about the ones that are decent and godly and that sort of thing. You hear about these weirdos. But it's amazing how many times it's true the love of money, of course, corrupts their soul at deeper and deeper levels as they become increasingly owned by things. Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Well, you cannot serve God and mammon. So the second major God of America is love of mammon. The first being self. The third, forces. The God of forces. I'm very happy that we have a strong military force, but we must remember that force is only as strong as God allows it to be. There are so many stories in the Bible where God takes an inferior force and overcomes a superior force. That is like a common thing in the Bible. We are fools if we think that our protection rests in the mighty power of our military might. I mean, Jeremiah complained against Israel and God said to them, let her battlements be taken and given to her enemies because they are not the Lord's. When we pull our military power out from under God, it won't protect us. The God of forces. Daniel speaks about it in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And there are many in this country who worship at the altar of the God of forces. And there are many in this country who worship at the altar of mammon. And there are many in this country who worship at the altar of self. And of course, they all interrelate and blend together. And it comes down to a worship of Satan. Because anytime worship is taken from God, it lands in his hands. No matter where else you put it, the minute worship is taken from God, Satan claims it. 
It goes to Him. And when we do that, we strengthen His power and might in the, in the country, in the land, and we strengthen His influence over the people and over our laws. The God of Mammon was tweaked by the destruction of the Twin Towers on 9-11. I think God sent us a powerful message then. Interesting that the symbol of the God of Mammon, if you will, was tweaked, not totally destroyed. Our economy wasn't totally wiped out, but it was as if God just went tweak. Said, oh, God didn't do that. Those, those Arabs going, dah, 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 down with America. That crowd did that. Yes, they did. But the reason they were able to get in is because America has been worshiping mammon. This is what you need to understand. When we take our worship from God and put it to other things, we give place to devils in our land. And we, op we make ourselves vulnerable to attack. And God let us see what can happen. And we got tweaked on the, uh, Mammon got his nose tweaked. And then the God of forces was tweaked when that plane landed on the Pentagon. The God of perverse freedom was also threatened, you know, that third plane, we understand, our fourth plane was on its way, we think, to either the Capitol or the, or the White House. But I believe there was enough remnant influence left in America that God had mercy. And interestingly, God-fearing patriots brought that plane down. Understand that Egypt's gods could not stand up to the God of the Hebrew slaves. And when Egypt's gods were broken, Pharaoh had no power to resist the people's demand for liberty. So let me, I've almost got to have to have another message. You know, I've run out of time here. But let me just summarize these next points. If the Lord burdens me to do it, I'll come back next week and finally finish this message. Amen. But how do we step forward to break the power of the devils that hold territory in our lives, in our land? And by the way, I should mention, this is true. This has application on your personal life, too. The devils attain place in your home if you've got idolatry going on, either superstitious idolatry or the sophisticated idolatry, the kind of idolatry that is comfortable giving worship that belongs to God to other things, letting other things control your decisions, whatever, and using rationalizations to just explain it away. Be careful about that. So breaking the power of the oppressor begins with a 2 Chronicles 7.14 move where the Bible says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall, keyword and beginning place, humble themselves. Here's the problem. A lot of times Christians read that and they skip over humble to pray. It's almost as if they read it this way. If my people, which are called by my name, shall pray and seek my face, that won't work. We've got to first humble ourselves and pray and seek His face. Humbling ourselves is the most critical first step to breaking the power of Satan in your life, in the life uh, of anybody in your home, in the life of your church, the life of your community, and throughout our nation. The very first thing that we must do is humble ourselves. And that's where prayer and fasting comes in. Because by fasting, we humble ourselves. We humble our soul through fasting. And our soul gets lifted up in pride in ways that we don't even identify. We can't even notice it. In fact, one of the most common, one of the most outstanding characteristics of a prideful spirit is the inability to see their pride. So sometimes it's a good idea just to hold off and do some fasting and praying just so you can find out how proud you've been. Because that is what will happen. The next thing, we must destroy the idols in our lives. I can read to you several examples in the Bible where great kings rose up and the people's hearts turned back to the Lord and the first thing they did is they went through the land destroying the idols in the land. We need to destroy the idols in our lives. We need to demand our liberty. The first thing God did when he was going to deliver God's people is he called a man and he sent that man to go stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. We need to say, to the powers that be, you can't do this. Thus saith the Lord, Governor, 
You're overstepping your authority. Thus saith the Lord, Miss Pelosi, and I guess it's Mrs. Pelosi. I might even have heard about her husband. I guess she's got one somewhere. And the rest of you guys, you are overstepping your authority. Somebody has got to speak God's word to those people. And then what also has to happen is we need to submit to God's ordained authority. And this is a tough one. I'm going to conclude with this. I kind of started with it. Let me conclude with this. And as the Lord leads, I'll maybe come back and address this a little more thoroughly next Sunday because the Sunday after that's all about Christmas. Amen. Remember that God chastised the Hebrew children for refusing to come under the rod of God in Moses' hands. And that is consistent throughout the Exodus story and on into the time of their, of their time in the wilderness and on in through their history. Disrespect for Christ's church today and His authority is a huge problem in America. Now we can spend the time with the caveats and talk about how many pastors have abused their authority and so kind of generated some of this problem. Amen. We preached against the shepherds here at the, the home conference. The shepherds who have not sought the Lord and, and there is that crowd. But of course, obviously, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, somebody who's clearly abusing his authority or his power. And I'm not even talking about somebody who's using his own authority or power. We're talking about those in, into whose hands God has put his rod. And in the case of ministry, in the pulpit ministry, who's preaching, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering. We need to submit ourselves to that. I need to submit myself to that. I said in the message, uh, as a matter of fact, Monday night, that God helped me never get to a place where I'm above being rebuked. There's nobody in this room above being rebuked, including me. May God, by His grace, help me to always live above reproach. But let me never get high-minded and think I'm above being rebuked. And I think those who know me and who've been around this ministry for any length of time know that's true. In fact, I consider it a blessing. If it's a genuine concern, if it's some made-up thing, that's a different matter. But when it's a legitimate rebuke, I receive it. And I'm helped by it. I thank God for it. So we're not talking about that. Moses was the meekest man on the planet in his day. But he also was the guy who came down with the, with the tablets of the law and stood on the hill and rebuked them for their idolatry and cast those tables down and caused an earthquake and, and the, I mean, you know, and beat their golden idols to dust and put it in the water and made them drink it. I mean, this is the meekest man that ever lived? Wow. But he was doing all of that under God. Not as God. And what we have a big problem because there are a lot of people in this country who don't understand that Jesus Christ is walking in the midst of his candlesticks. He's in the midst of his churches. We have got to have a return to the Lord's churches. I'm telling you, there are so many guys out there who are going to do this and who are going to do that to save America. But until they submit to the authority of Christ and in his churches, the real churches, they're not submitting themselves to the rod of God. There's nobody who's above rebuke and reproof from the Holy Scriptures. Nobody. Not the President of these United States, and I'm not complaining that he is not under the reproof. I think he goes to church and hears reproof, I suppose. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. Not the President, not any congressperson, not any senator, not anybody that's going to lead a movement to save California or to save America, not anybody who's going to uh, lead this state, or lead this country. Not one of them is above submitting themselves to being reproved and rebuked and exhorted by the Word of God regularly. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to, you know, this is my thing, and so that's the reason I'm doing this. If some devil told you that, and you're listening to him, A, you don't know me at all. 
you have no clue who I am. And B, your issue is with this book, not with me. We're talking about some reproving and rebuking going on here. Because I'm not telling you something that comes out of 1 Jerry chapter 1. I'm telling you something that comes out of the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, God's Word. Jesus said, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves as they that watch for your souls. The Scripture teaches this principle. And I'm not going to, because of my own vanity and fear of man's faces, not just tell you what the Bible says, because I'm afraid how it's going to make me look. I don't care how it makes me look. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. The Bible says we're supposed to submit to those that God has placed in authority over us in His house. We're supposed to do that. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says we're supposed to esteem them very highly for their labor's sake. The Bible says that. Jerry doesn't say that. The Bible says that. I'm just telling you what God said. He said, well, you're the pastor. You're saying it for your own self. Okay, if you think that, you've just believed a seducing spirit that's teaching you a, a lie, planting a lie in your mind in order to get you out from under God's rod. Because I lived this before I became a pastor. I lived this. I did this. I submitted to this. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but I'll just give you one short story. And some of you are saying, yeah, right, short story. <laughs> one time I was talking to my, I, had, I was the leader of the youth group. And we were talking and somebody said something that caused me to believe that my pastor was angry with me about something. Now, I'm not saying you're supposed to do this. I'm just illustrating where my spirit is. I'm trying to help you have a little insight into the guy that's talking to you like this, where he's coming from. All right, so... I, something was said I forget what it was now in detail and we were about two maybe three miles from the church and the pastor lived in a parsonage next door to the church and when I heard that I got very alarmed and I literally ran as hard as I could all the way to his house I knocked on the door he came to the door and he said Jerry what in the world I was all sweaty and red and <laughs> You know, I was tired. I ran, I ran hard. And he said, come in here. He said, let me get you some water. And he gave me, I finally was able to calm down enough so I could talk. I said, Pastor, did I hurt you in any way? I heard this. and I don't remember what it was. I just remember what I felt at the time. And I told him that. And he said, no, 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 no. I don't know where in the world that came from. But that's not true at all. And we had a conversation. And it was all sorted out. Let me tell you something. I'm, I live what I preach. Well, I try to. And I'm not saying this because I think it's something to, and by the, at that time, by the way, I had no idea of being a preacher. At that time, I was going to be a, I was going to be a rock and roller for Jesus. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's where, that's where I was headed at that time in my life. I was going to rock and roll for Jesus. I was way ahead of these guys. But I learned better. So no, it wasn't that at all. What I am saying to you, though, is this. The church has got to assert its place. It needs to step up. It needs to get out in front of this mess and preach God's word to these things. Amen? That's what has to happen. And God's people need to respond to God's word. And you know me, I've preached this all my ministry, really. What I desire is to see God's people's heart respond to what God says in his book, then I have great peace and joy. I like that. I don't like it when somebody does something because I told them about it. I, you ask Becky. I'm always uncomfortable with that. And so I say all the time, when you see it in God's word and your faith attaches to what God said and because, and because of that it changes what you do, woo, we are really in tall cotton. This is good. That's what I want. Amen? Chief shepherd. A personal connection between you and the chief shepherd. That's what we want. We need, however, for the church to step up and step out and get in front of this thing 
and start preaching God's word to this. And of course, this church does that. We've been doing that for a long time. But there are a lot of Christians who don't get it. That's the point of the message. There's going to have to be, the rod is going to have to fall upon the Hebrews and the Egyptians. Until the Hebrew children, and you know what I'm saying in the metaphor here, get it and humble themselves. Then they can wield the sword with real power and real authority. Let's stand together, please.